Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Center for the Living Cities Lecture Series. Today, we have our Jane Jacobs Lectures with dark sky advocate and photographer, Betty Maya Foote. She will, guide us, <laughs> Maya. she will guide us through a conversation on how disappearing darkness and starlight are causing or worsening many of our problems in cities and the environment. She'll offer practical suggestions for how each of us can contribute to solutions in the design field as community members. But challenges us to think of light pollution as a serious environmental concern and not simply as an aesthetic issue. We'd like to give a special thank you to Marywood University School of Architecture here for sponsoring this lecture. So just a few more words about Betty Maya. She's incredible. <laughs> Betty Maya loves to bring people to the dark side. As Director of Engagement for the International Dark Sky Association, IDA, Betty Maya works with a global community of dark sky defenders, empowering them with tools, resources, and inspiration to protect the night sky. An avid astrophotographer, you can usually find her out under the stars with her camera battling off the mosquitoes. Betty Maya's photography has been featured in Sky and Telescope, National Geographic, and the Los Angeles Times. Her dark sky efforts have reached Texas, Kansas City, and the New York Times. Her dark sky career began, began working for the Utah State Parks, starting 12 international dark sky park applications across the state. She then worked as the coordinator for the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative and the Consortium for Dark Sky Studies at the University of Utah before making her way to IDA. Preserving dark skies is her life goal, and she is incredibly excited to continue this journey of saving the stars. And we are incredibly excited to have her here with us today. Betty Maya, thank you so much. Um, so we're going to let you have the floor for about, I don't know, half hour or so, and then I'm going to disappear. And uh, please, as you're all watching, feel free to drop the questions into the Q&A section. And that when she's finished, I'll pop back on and we'll answer some questions for the last few minutes. Betty Maya, thank you. Thank you so much, Maria and Chelsea. It's an honor to be here. Um, I worked with Chelsea and Steven in one of my first ever dark sky jobs. Um, so it's kind of really cool to come full circle and definitely quite an honor to be here with you all today. So here we go. That looks all right. All right, I will, I will assume that looks good. And I'm not muted and you guys can hear me. Okay, so thank you guys for being here and thank you for the kind introduction, Maria. Uh, my name is Betty Maya and I work for the International Dark Sky Association. Um, it's my dream job. It was always a pipe dream to work in the field of dark skies and somehow I found a career path to be here today. So I'm really looking forward to sharing all of this with you and hopefully bringing all of you along to the dark side as well. So I really like to start sometimes with darkness. People have a very negative perception of darkness in our society today. We hear phrases a lot like being kept in the dark or how we can be enlightened. And those show us just how ingrained into our society the values of dark and light are. Dark is evil, it's scary, bad. Enlightenment is pure, it's knowledge, it's good. But we forget that it takes darkness to know light. And these values that we place on light and dark have a very real impact on our society on a lot of levels. Our world has been transformed by electric light in less than 150 years since its introduction. For most of us around the world, this is the kind of night we experience. Dull, hazy, gray, with just a few stars struggling to be seen. More than 80% of the world's population and 99% of us in the United States and Europe live under skies like this. But what exactly is light pollution? I'll tell you that light pollution is real pollution. 
It is human-made light interfering with natural nocturnal environments. This kind of light pollution we're looking at here has a special name. It's called sky glow. And it sounds really cool, but it is not cool. <laughs> sky glow is caused by light that is directed out onto the horizon or up into the night sky, scattering throughout our atmosphere, making the light appear to come from the sky itself. It reduces the contrast visible in the night sky so we can see less of the faint celestial details, only the brightest stars and planets. Another form of light pollution is flare. Someone not turning off their brights on a lonely dark road is probably the best example of this that we've all felt, but it happens a lot with bright street lights and can decrease safety of pedestrians. And finally, light trespass. Um, has anybody here been kept awake by light streaming into your bedroom window at night? Me too. And this is a prime example of light trespass. When light is falling outside of the property boundary onto another property or home. And this is actually how I got started in light pollution advocacy work. It's how a lot of people get started. Uh, we get a lot of calls like, my neighbor's light is shining into my bedroom window. Can you tell them to turn it off? Um, and while we don't do that at IDA, we do equip you with the resources and tools to have that conversation and to help mitigate this issue because it's definitely an annoyance. Um, but I didn't know about light pollution until I was actually in a class with Stephen Goldsmith, who I'm sure many of you know, um, in an urban ecology class, and we watched the film, The City Dark. And I had never heard the term light pollution before, but I grew up in rural Utah where the skies are magnificent. The Milky Way is out every night. It's some of the darkest, most beautiful skies in the whole world. Uh, but it wasn't until I moved up to Salt Lake City that I learned what it was like to not have a night sky. And not only that, that there is a whole global movement of people around the world working to bring the night sky back. So huge thanks to Stephen and the urban ecology classes that I'm sure a lot of you are taking uh, because it really helps enlighten people about this issue that can be kind of a hidden pollution. Uh, so once I learned what light pollution was, I realized I was living in a dorm where a bright, terrible acorn light fixture was shining right into my bedroom window. And um, I was able to get a grant from our campus to change the lighting, work with facilities. We changed about like 11 lights, which wasn't much, but from there that changed the campus standard to have better lighting fixtures as the bad lights go out. Um, so small victories do make a difference. But still, all forms of light pollution are growing. We are not designing cities on a large scale with the power of light in mind. And because of this, it's really not hard to imagine a future with no natural darkness remaining, which to me is a very scary thought. I've experienced the growth of light pollution firsthand in my hometown of Moab, Utah. Um, I used to be able to see the Milky Way from Main Street downtown. And because there was literally nothing else to do as a high schooler, sometimes we would go lay out in the middle of Main Street and look up at the stars before the advent of Instagram and Moab exploding. Um, but now just like a decade or so later, you can't see the night sky that well unless you're farther outside of town. Um, I took this photo just a few minutes from my house, which is a little south of town. And looking towards downtown, you can see it looks like a bomb is exploding. Um, and all of the bright lights on the left side of that image are from just one building. And I'm sure many of you may have stories like this as well. Um, I know a lot of people who are older than me, who have lived longer, who have mentioned, you know, they used to be able to see the Milky Way from downtown in big cities when they were kids, right? This is happening fast. And this is something that we need to address urgently. So we rate the darkness of our skies using the Bortle scale, which is a, a scale developed by amateur astronomer, John Bortle. 
uh, because he got really frustrated. People would say, oh, come out here. It's so dark and beautiful. And then he would get there and it wouldn't be that dark at all. So as a way to quantify the darkness of the night sky, he came up with a scale that goes from the darkest possible sky, which is class one, to the most light polluted skies, which is our class nine. And the very darkest places in the continental United States today are almost never darker than a class two and are increasingly threatened. For someone standing on a mecca of dark skies, the north rim of the Grand Canyon, which is this photo, the brightest feature in the sky is not the Milky Way, but the glow of Las Vegas, over 175 miles away. Light is so much more powerful than we think. These are your basic Home Depot wall packs, right? Probably the worst, worst possible type of light you could have. Um, so if someone took one of these, just one, and installed it on the moon facing the earth, you could see it with the telescope. So seeing the Milky Way has really become a rare experience for a majority of the world's population in just a few generations. If light pollution continues to grow at its current rate, most children today will reach adulthood never having seen it or even knowing what the Milky Way is. All future generations could be lost to the magic of darkness and starlight. But that is why we're here, right? At the Center for the Living City, Jane Jacobs walks. Light pollution is simply a design problem. We currently design places and spaces and cities with no thought about the power of light. But this organization is fighting to change that and to think about designing cities holistically. So a huge thank you to Chelsea and Maria and Steven and everybody supporting Dark Skies here today. You are making a difference. And because of people like you all around the world, we are quantifying these differences when people keep design and healthy environments in mind. I'll just share one example here from the Mont Megantic Observatory in Quebec, Canada. Uh, they're an international dark sky reserve and 2007 was the first year that they became certified through IDA. This image is showing a CCD camera documentation of the entire night sky, which is a really scientifically accurate way to quantify how much light pollution is in the sky. They actually have these algorithms that can subtract the natural light, like stars in the Milky Way and air glow, which is different than sky glow, but air glow is the good one. Um, and then you're left with just artificial light. And then here is that same CCD imaging done 10 years later. And we can see that light pollution did not grow during the first decade of their designation as an international dark sky reserve, albeit while the population grew by 12%. In fact, the light pollution actually slightly decreased. We can see the sky quality index increasing um, and the average anthropogenic sky luminance decreasing, albeit minimally, but this shows that we can halt the growth of light pollution and even tip the curve in the other direction with concerted actions, just like everyone here is working on. So it is possible to make changes for the better and we are seeing it all over the world. And there are a lot of reasons to curb light pollution beyond just being able to see the stars. Installing better lighting also has huge benefits to the environment and ecology of the area. Artificial light at night exposure impacts almost every single species ever studied by scientists. It interferes with their biology and changes how they interact with the environment. This harms ecosystems and can make plants and animals less resilient in the face of environmental change. Flooding a nocturnal environment with artificial light destroys habitat no less than bulldozing trees in a rainforest. So organisms on the surface of the earth experience natural levels of light that vary by factors of over 1 billion times. 
The rising and setting of the sun and moon set light levels and the timing and duration of light exposure. They are the most important sources of light in the natural environment, and they establish cues that species look for around them. This tells them when to engage in certain behaviors like finding food and mates. Many species, like you'll see, and also dung beetles, which is cool, rely on very dim sources of natural light, such as starlight, for orientation and navigation. Artificial light can disrupt the activities of these species. Their behaviors evolved over billions of years in the presence of only natural sources of light at night. A big one is birds who migrate at night, most of them do. Uh, they use the stars and other celestial cues to complete their Herculean migrations thousands of miles across the land and sea. And they're both attracted and disoriented by bright city lights. It's estimated that over 1 billion birds die per year due to collisions with buildings, many in areas their migratory paths should never have crossed. And these that you see here, they're not insects, they're birds trapped in lights that are beaming up towards the night sky. But after these lights are switched off for just 20 minutes, most if not all of the birds are able to find their way back to their migratory path. Light pollution has also been named as a driver of the insect apocalypse. Excess light makes it really difficult for species like fireflies that rely on bioluminescent cues to find mates. Some insects use polarized lights to find bodies of water where they breed, and reflections from outdoor fixtures confuse their sense of direction. For instance, mayflies, which only live and breed for one single day, can be confused by light bouncing off asphalt and lay their eggs in the street instead of a lake or stream. A mistake like that can wipe out an entire population in one night. Then, of course, there are the moths, right? Like moths to a flame or moths to our porch light. Um, it's estimated that up to one third of the bugs swirling around our porch light will die by morning, either being gobbled up by predators or simply from exhaustion. And if you want to get the feels for moths, what I learned is that they also use celestial cues to navigate and they keep the moon or other bright celestial objects on one side of their field of vision in order to fly in a straight line. So that worked back in the day when the moon was infinitely far away. But nowadays, when that moon becomes your porch light, they fly around it in circles thinking they're going in a straight line. And it just makes me want to cry for the moths. I've never felt more sad about moths than when I learned that. And of course, we're really not all that different from insects. Um, life on Earth, including our own life, is adapted to the rotation of our planet. And for many years, we have known that living organisms, including humans, have an internal biological clock that helps us anticipate and adapt to the regular rhythm of the day. Um, but how does this clock actually work? In 2017, the Nobel, Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine was awarded to scientists who were actually able to isolate a gene that controls our normal daily biological rhythm. And other scientists have figured out that light sensitive cells in the retina of, of the eye couples light exposure to the system regulating the circadian rhythm. This involves melanopsin, which is a substance that is very sensitive to blue light. So exposure to blue light in the morning and darkness in the evening regulate our entire circadian rhythm, our sleep-wake cycle. Our body produces melatonin when it gets dark and stops when we experience light. So light pollution streaming in through windows or you know, interior lights like screens or refrigerator lights stop this production of melatonin. And this has been linked to a plethora of human health impacts. Um, but this is a growing body of research and it is not now possible for us to directly say outdoor light at night causes cancer. Um, but in my read, all of the arrows keep pointing in the direction that this trip in the circadian rhythm can have drastic effects on our health from the obvious insomnia all the way to how we metabolize and gain weight and all types of cancers. 
Uh, but here in the science, our knowledge is still incomplete. Saying that, in 2016, the American Medical Association released recommendations for limiting exposure to artificial light at night and utilizing dark sky friendly lighting practices. And any health impacts are disproportionate as the distribution of light pollution throughout different segments of our society varies drastically. Studies show that Asian, Latino, or Black Americans have exposure to light pollution in their neighborhoods two times that of white Americans. So we can think about light pollution as a social justice issue. Light is often weaponized against people of color. Terrible light polluting fixtures in high crime areas trespass into people's windows, disrupting sleep, and reinforcing the power dynamics of surveillance and control. This is an image showing the lighting project in New York City dubbed Omnipresence, which involves floodlights powered by noisy generators pointed at housing projects all night long. You would never see this type of lighting in better resourced communities. Residents have raised legitimate concerns about these floodlights. They report being unable to sleep and experiencing headaches. And we sure are wasting a lot of money and energy to light up the bottom of the International Space Station, basically. The US Department of Energy reports that well under 1% of light at night actually reaches a human's eye. This means that 99% of outdoor lighting is wasted light. Only 1% of nighttime lighting serves a useful purpose, and some of it actually can make us less safe. In the United States, outdoor lighting creates 228 million metric tons of carbon dioxide each year. If we cut 99% of that, we would save $15 billion annually. Dark skies save the planet and a lot of money. The belief that outdoor lighting improves traffic safety and discourages or prevents crime is common. It may explain in part the rapid growth in the use of outdoor light at night in recent years and decades. There are cases when the careful application of outdoor lighting may improve nighttime safety, but there is no general benefit supported by scientific evidence. There are many conflicting research results on this topic. Some studies find that adding light to outdoor spaces reduces crime and road collisions. Others find either a negative effect, no effect at all, or unclear results. Many of the claims about outdoor lighting and its impact on crime and traffic safety, for better or for worse, may be fundamentally wrong because of the inability to isolate variables. One thing we do know, though, is that glare from bright artificial light sources is a particular concern for nighttime safety. It results from intense light rays entering the eye directly from a source. Some of that light scatters in our eyes, reducing the contrast between foreground and background. Glare reduces the visibility of objects at night for motorists, pedestrians, and bicyclists, and decreases safety. So while we are still learning more about this subject, it is clear that lighting needs to be installed well in order to not have the unintended effect of actually decreasing safety. Um, and this is where I like to point out that we are the International Dark Sky Association, um, not dark ground, right? We are not saying turn off every single one of your lights. We are really just advocating for thinking about lighting design in a way that is human-centric, environmental-centric, and thinks about all beings that inhabit the space. Luckily, it's really simple to protect and restore darkness with a more holistic approach to lighting design in our cities and homes. It's really just a design problem, which is why I'm so happy to be talking to a lot of design-minded people today here. So first we'll talk about color. And um, I can't see the chat, but do people know why our sky is blue during the day? It's, it's blue because that wavelength of light scatters easiest throughout our atmosphere. And this is known as Rayleigh's scattering. 
So here we can see that the nanometers of blue light have the highest rate of scattering in our atmosphere, almost nine and a half that of amber light. So what kind of lighting would be the worst for sky glow? You guessed it, blue light. It scatters the farthest and makes the largest dome of sky glow. And what kind of lighting is being installed in a majority of places around the world? Bright blue, white LEDs. The low cost and high efficiency of LEDs sounds good, but can actually encourage overlighting through a rebound effect. And while there is peril in LEDs and how they are currently being installed with no thought for the nighttime environment, there is also promise. The characteristics of LED lighting can enable its more efficient use, often requiring less light for the same applications than previous technologies. When cities plan LED retrofits carefully and utilize warmer colored lighting, they can hold light pollution steady or even reduce it. We saw this directly in Tucson, Arizona. The city converted nearly 20,000 streetlights from high pressure sodium to energy efficient LEDs with adaptive controls, basically meaning dimming. The plan projected a savings of $2.16 million annually for the city and a 60% reduction in lumen output from street lighting. And the amount of people who actually noticed the lighting was different at all was less than 10, uh, according to the city of Tucson. So even when, this is basically what happens in Tucson, they're at 90% until midnight and then they dim to 30%. Um, when less people are out. And our eyes at night don't actually see brightness, they see contrast. So while you're standing there, it's really, really hard even to notice the difference when it's dimming uh, because we just notice the difference between light and dark, not the overall intensity of the light itself. Uh, so this sh really shows that when cities plan lighting carefully, it can be done in a way that benefits all of the inhabitants and especially benefits the city's bottom line. So when you're thinking about designing lighting in spaces, um, IDA and the Illuminating Engineering Society came up with these five principles to keep in mind. Uh, first one is start with natural darkness, right? Starting with natural darkness and then only add light where it is needed. So do you need the light at all? Only put it there if you really need it. A lot of lights are there as the jewelry of the home or you know, just a legacy fixture that exists just because if you need a light to put your key in your door, that's fine. But do you really need it to shine up into your tree? Aim your light down to the task at hand, not out into your neighbor's window or up into the night sky. Use only as much light, as much brightness as you need and no more. Install timers, motion sensors, or dimmers to reduce light usage. And finally, use warmer colored lights. They're lower wavelength, generally less impactful to humans and the environment. Um, and they're more romantic, right? It's like a nice firelight as opposed to your hospital style bright white lighting. Um, I think it's an easy choice here. And unlike other types of pollution that are really difficult to remove from the environment, we can solve light pollution with the flip of a switch at the speed of light. It's a win-win for everyone. We save money, energy, wildlife, and our own human health, all while restoring the awe and the beauty of the natural night sky. Um, and another way you can get involved is I was just chatting earlier with um, Maria and Chelsea about how um, Jane Jacobs walks about night skies are a great way to get your community involved in this. Um, in 2017 in Salt Lake City, um, I was lucky enough to lead one of these and a bunch of people came uh, 
it's cool that people come to these things to walk around town and look at, and look at lights, but more people came than I expected. News crews came, journalists came, and we walked around downtown Salt Lake City and looked at, you know, the nesting peregrine falcon boxes in the city, some of the bad lights, some of the good lights, and identified what could be different, how this could be um, lit in a way that benefits everybody. And um, it was a really, really cool way to get people involved and spread the word. So I would highly recommend uh, leading your own walks or attending some, and I'm sure Chelsea and Maria can help you all um, do that. And I'm also more than happy to uh, provide any insight. And please join us, uh, the IDA Advocate Network. Uh, that's my main gig at IDA. I like to think of it as just a bunch of dark sky friends. Uh, so this QR code will get you to our Grassroots Advocates page. Uh, we have a dark sky advocate network where thousands of people from all around the world come together to share their experiences, questions, thoughts about light pollution and restoring natural darkness. Uh, we have monthly advocate action meetings where we work on a specific topic. Uh, there are monthly member meetings where you can learn about different dark sky interesting things. Uh, we just had one yesterday on the power of awe in the night sky and utilizing that uh, to leverage dark sky protections. Uh, so please join us, uh, make some dark sky friends. It's a really inspiring place because it can be lonely to be, you know, feel like the only person in your community that cares about this issue. Uh, but there is truly a global network of people who are all some of the coolest people I've ever met that are doing incredible work to bring back the night sky. Uh, so I hope you consider joining us. Our next advocate action meeting will be on December 8th, where we will be learning about how to get International Dark Sky Week proclamations in your city, state, and even country. We're gonna go for the White House this year, which I'm really excited about. Uh, so please sign up the Advocate Network to get more information on how to join. And I'll just close by uh, saying that for millennia, stars have guided us, given us hope and connected us as beings on one planet in one spinning galaxy, riding through space and time, light and dark together. If we lose the night sky, we lose a deep part of what it means to be human on earth. By reaching out together to shield or dim lights or simply to flip off the switch, we practice using our power to do big ambitious things on behalf of ourselves and future generations. Instead of closing off our planet, our minds and our lives to the wonder and hope of the stars, let's welcome them with open skies. Thank you. And that's my email, bettymaya at darksky.org. If anyone wants to reach out, um, at bettymaya.foot is my Instagram, where you can see pretty night sky photos. Um, and I forgot to put our website, but our website is just darksky.org to get involved with IDA. Thank you, Betty Maya. That was wonderful. Thank you, Maria. Appreciate that. I I need to start with the first comment in the Q&A, which is from our very own Stephen Goldsmith. I don't know if you could see it. I he will says, bring it up. Thank you for your vital work. I'm going to read this because it is very, very true. You are a treasure and way too modest about the work you have done and do. Is the IDA working to develop a curriculum? This is interesting for architecture schools. If we are to go to the source of so much light pollution, teaching architects seems like a critical intervention. So Stephen's right, you are way too modest about the work you do and your incredible photography is just beautiful. We've been um, enjoying it for the last several weeks here in this architecture school in Scranton, Pennsylvania. <laughs> and um, you know, with that, we have talked a bit about this. It's not something that's required in uh, the curriculum of an architecture school to understand light pollution. We talk about it in our school because we were grateful enough to um, you know, be associated to get to know Stephen and to understand what how critical this issue is. And the last few years, we've been rolling it into our curriculum. But I do think this is something that should, at some point, 
catch on and be vital to designers to understand. I mean, there's just so much about it that we should know as the purveyors of the built environment. So it's not, Stephen, to, your, to, to answer you, it's not something that's required by our accrediting bodies, NAB, but it certainly should be. And we should work towards that. Uh, and I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but Maya, how often do you talk with architects or designers in your line of work? Yeah, well, hi, Stephen. Thank you so much for yeah, your time. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad to know you're here. Um, but well, first of all, I would love any advice from you guys on the side of being architecture people, like where to go, where do we go to start that conversation? Uh, we did, uh, we are, I think, very close to having a grant to develop an education program in 2023, which I'm really, really excited about. And so that will be available and um, could be a really great launching point to try to get architectural right. planners, designers really involved in that. We do, um, in my own personal work, I've worked a lot more with lighting designers than I have with architects mm -hmm. personally, but a lot of lighting designers are integrated with the Illuminating Engineering Society, Mm -hmm. And they hold like like pretty regular lectures on dark skies, and they actually just held a symposium on the issue of light justice. Um, so I think it is becoming more of an issue that people are aware of. But I do know that you can be a lead credited building without even with that with having really bad lighting. Yeah, you know? so yeah. there's a huge gap that we need to bridge, and yeah. would definitely be interested in hearing any ideas that you guys have from your side as well. So the grant on the education piece, where, who would you be educating um, younger folks or just like architects? Who was the target audience for the education? I think the target audience really is just our advocate network, which is from, you know, the youngest high schoolers to your oldest grandpa astronomer. It's really right. everywhere in between. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that education would be focused for a general audience, but could mm -hmm. really be applicable to a lot of different fields. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess we're, we're, we're going to follow up on that. That's, you know, you definitely Great. need to keep this on our radar for a certain. Yeah. Um, we have so many questions from so many students that you may not see in the Q&A because we've been studying this work for the last few weeks in some of our urban ecology courses here. But I have a quick one from Megan um, and she has a bunch in, our, in the other, but this is an interesting, she said, with the holiday season right around the corner, just decorating your house, the lights cause, cause greater light pollution. It's interesting, how can we fix that problem? Yeah, so definitely it does. There have been studies that show that Christmas lighting does increase light pollution globally. Um, that's also compounded with the fact that there's a lot of snow on the ground in the Christmas lighting season um, that reflects a lot more of that light up into the night sky. Um, but for me, Christmas lights is not the hill that I want to die on. Like if you want right. to have Christmas <laughs> lights, I say go for it. Just like turn them off at 11 p.m. or midnight. Right, you know, exactly. And don't leave them on all night long. <laughs> um, so I think it's a pretty simple fix to just not have them on all night long. Have them on for a while while people are out and enjoying and appreciating it. But turn them off so the birds. Timers, can dimmers, those um, sensors that they're really mm -hmm. with Yep. Um, so I have a question from Lauren Beamer here. Um, is there a correlation between 99% of the wasted light and the impervious pavement we park on and occupy for small points? Both are waste of resources and harmful to our environment. So she's asking about paving and how is, is all the paved, parking lots probably impervious pavement a big source to add to this light pollution issue? Definitely. Yeah. So the albedo of surfaces is a huge thing to keep in mind when lighting for a space. So if there's a really, you know, a bright white concrete area, you probably need a lot less light to get your desired illumination than if it's like a grassy field. Right. Um, you know, grassy areas reflect a lot less light up into the night sky and trees over lights can actually be used as a kind of a natural shield for the night sky as well. It doesn't work in the winter, um, right, when right. no leaves, but it, it can be helpful as well. Right. And, um, we, we, um, we visit the High Line often here and because we're close to New York and we did a, we watched a video on the landscaping of the High Line and how the light was 
down, like, you know, everything is down, right? Like under the handrails, everything is low. And the vegetation is definitely used as a canopy to shield the light. So the lighting was very carefully considered in the high line to not yeah. create pollution. I got so to go to New York uh, recently and I made sure to go to the High Line because I also learned about that in Stephen's yeah, class. So. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you know, I hope Stephen could feel his, his influence all over the place here. <laughs> um, I have a couple of tons of questions, so I'll try to get through as many as I can. Um, this is from Ian Carrigan. Does using light within the building have a sizable impact on light pollution or is it typically just the light or is that what is the light relatively contained? compared to the exterior of the of a building that's a great question ian mm -hmm. um no it's bad like and i'm just looking behind you maria like yeah those lights on with those giant windows like birds will smash right into that you know so yep. um it's a huge huge issue interior lighting is definitely something to think about um luckily it's pretty simple to draw blinds at night in a lot of places um mm -hmm. you know skyscrapers and buildings that are really high with bright lights on inside um because we can, we're, we're going to confuse the wildlife like we're going to exactly. confuse them. yeah and blackout curtains should be used for their original purpose which right. is actually to keep light inside of the building instead of keeping it uh from coming into your window with light trespass but it's definitely something to consider and one of the huge factors in bird collisions with buildings yeah you know we do have that problem here with those big windows. So yeah, yeah. you get it. But then, and you can put those little like dots on them. Yeah, um, we did that, the reflectors. That's how we solved it. We yeah. tried to- Very remember. good, nice. <laughs> um, I have some questions about your photography. I have tons of those too. So I have one regarding, let's see, I'm gonna put two together. So this is another one from Ian and I'm going to one from Lindsay. Um, so Ian asks about a DSLR camera capturing the night sky significantly more clearly than the human eye. And then Lindsay asks, can you capture the night sky from your camera um, on your phone? <laughs> do you yeah. think the phone has the ability to do the same thing? Or is, yeah. so talk about maybe a little bit about how do we capture sure. it? Thank you. So yeah, cameras are an incredible instrument to really capture more light than we can see with our human eye. I think mm -hmm. our eyes are actually continually capturing at like a 60th of a second exposure time. So right. in my like dream robot tech world, I would be able to change my eyes to like <laughs> capture 30 <laughs> seconds of light before uh -huh. sending it to my brain. Uh, <laughs> but unfortunately our eyes don't work like that, but cameras right. do. So like the light and the color you can see in a camera is there but it's not what you'll see with your eye when you're at a dark sky site. And I wish I could find um, this presentation that I did because I tried to, I did like a, a comparison of mm -hmm. what it looks like to the eye versus what it looks like to the camera. Um, oh, I see, yeah. I can, yeah. I can look for that, Maria, and send it to you after. Oh, that'd be fantastic. They um, would love to see that, yeah. But yeah, our eyes don't actually see color in the dark at all. Um, our rod cells are activated at night, which detect right. light and dark, but our cone cells are not in our night vision. So our cone cells see color. So we're not really able to capture that color when we're just looking at the night sky. But, does a, cam but a camera can't. A camera yeah. does, yeah. Oh, that's so, so that's why you'll see that color in those images. Come through the cameras. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. That's and fascinating, then, yeah. Yeah, and then in terms of the cell phone um, question, right, right, my right. like iPhone six does not. <laughs> but <laughs> if you have like one of the newer iPhones or the Google Pixel, you uh -huh. can get amazing images of the night sky on your cell phone. Or GoPros are also uh -huh. really good. Oh, right, at capturing yeah. Night sky images, and we actually we do a photo contest every year for IDA, and one of the categories is mobile photography, and it's Sweet. incredible. You should take a look at. Um, at the winners from the mobile phone. Okay, category. we definitely will. That's yeah, amazing. it's so cool to see what phones can capture. Um, Chelsea's behind the scenes here. Chelsea, can you drop in the um, the website of IDA just so it's in the chat or the Q and A? Maybe I don't know where to do it, but we need to. We need to. Yeah, you um, can drop in the website. Um, okay, so let's see. Piper asks, can cities such as New York make easily make the change to using less light or dimming the light? Take Times Square, for instance. 
they use abundance of light to get the attention of bystanders. So is it how hard is this to get cities to to understand this, I guess, and make the shift? Yeah, it's really hard. <laughs> it's bet, definitely, yeah. I mean, it all starts, I think, with our perception of light is good and brightness is progress and wealth and growth. And, um, you know, lots of businesses and cities see that as a way to attract people, right? They're not going to come if I don't have the brightest sign or the brightest storefront. Um, but I do think like we are seeing larger cities take notice. And Pittsburgh recently um, passed a dark sky ordinance, which is the first of its kind for a city of that scale. And they will be replacing 35,000 streetlights with dark sky friendly lights. Um, and I think it just shows that cities are becoming aware that, you know, people in New York City may not ever be able to see the Milky Way from Times Square, right? That just might be a truth that we have to accept. Mm -hmm. But people in the community can have better, healthier lighting for their own human health and for the environment. And uh, we can shrink the circle of light pollution. So people have to travel less far to be able to get out and experience a natural night sky than they currently do. Right. Um, and I also think like larger cities, I would love like IDA, hopefully at some point will come up with a way to recognize larger cities that are doing right. this kind of work. Right, because right. Currently we're just really like focused on like the darkest places and the perfect lighting ordinances, but right. we let perfect be the enemy of the good. And I think we really need to start celebrating larger cities that are, that are doing this. The city of Malibu also, mm -hmm. they installed bright blue LED lights and the community hated it and right. had to spend like millions of dollars to replace them. Uh -huh. um, so it's something that really should be thought about in terms of like community well-being and not just seeing the stars. Right. There's a, a great um, comment and sort of question in the chat in the Q&A from an anonymous attendee. And it states related to this topic, many cities like to decoratively light their buildings with shifting colors to related feeling of a vitality. Um, and are there any suggestions on how to blend? So I guess this is it to blend the goals of the dark sky and call the colorful lighting needs to turn them off on a cycle so they are on and off or long enough to reorient the birds, lower light levels so they aren't as bright. So I guess that speaks to really what we were just talking about, like engaging with the cities in their goals for what the light levels in their city are their aspirations are like why they like their cities a certain way and then coming up with creative probably solutions or strategies and how to to work together with um and clearing the environment and doing the work that needs to get done to um be sensitive to these issues so i yeah. think there's conversations to be had there right yeah and i think it's really about like you can apply the five lighting principles on a bunch of different scales right. that is like, very if, you wanna, yeah. if you want to light up a building facade you know maybe don't point a bright white light up from the bottom you could do like a nice amber or red light from the top down and yeah, still yeah. kind of achieve that same look and yeah. feel that you're going for um yeah curfews and timers and it's my dream my life goal to get the Luxor beam to just be red, you know, like that would be a step, you know, as some kind of recognition that like, we need to think about other beings besides ourselves. And Babak Tafreshi, who's an incredible astrophotographer has a video uh, wow. similar to the one of the birds flying, but of the Luxor beam and just tons of birds, tons of insects flying wow. all around wow. through it. And so if anyone has connections at the Luxor, please pass <laughs> them my way. <laughs> Betty May has some things to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's another great, I'm going to try to go, there's so many here. We have 10 minutes left. So um, Nancy Pierce, so true. Light pollution, especially glare, really impacts older people more than yeah. younger people. So that many elders have stopped driving or even walking around entertainment areas at night the older I cannot adjust as well to glare. And it is definitely another aspect of social injustice. That is so true. I mean, just think about, you know, they, you know, our elderly population, they just struggle with, with seeing and vision issues. It's just a whole world of, of understanding what glare can do to 
like a, a, a softer, dimmer, lower, lower to the ground light is much more um, welcoming for elders to get around. And I mean, we are all living much longer, you know, in this world. So definitely is a social injustice. I agree. Yeah. And like beyond uh, just elder eyes having a harder time, there are a lot of like physical um, conditions that are impacted by lighting in different ways. And this is something that I need to look more into, but, you know, flickering LED lighting can induce seizures in some conditions. Right, yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of ways that, that light can impact um, different populations. Right. So another quick question. This is so interesting. We have such interesting questions. This is from Rihanna Capriotti. I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, but uh, this is a great question. Well, she just said thank you. I'm getting tons of thank yous, by the way. This is a, a lovely, yeah, lovely to learn about. This is a student who's starting a master's course at Edinburgh University in the UK. I would love to be able to integrate what you've spoken about into the urban landscape design in the future. So this is great. This is exactly the purpose of this lecture and to get the word out about this very important work. Thank you, Rihanna. And then she asked um, a quick question. She said, were there any studies conducted on light pollution throughout COVID? So she's from England and definitely noticed that the light pollution reduced a lot during the pandemic and the lockdowns. But was it really studied? Like, why do you think the light pollution went down because people were inside more maybe? Like, what do you, was there any thought on what yeah. COVID did to lighting? So I'll have to look into that, Rihanna, um, but I will say anecdotally that so many people being shut down in their houses and businesses being closed, we're actually going outside and looking up more because there was nothing else to do. So right. we got a huge influx of people reaching out, wanting to get involved in night sky activities and dark sky stuff because they were finally like people slowed down enough to remember to look up. Um, and I think that was something that um, was people hadn't done before. I really thought about the, the lockdown for all of its faults gave them that opportunity to do so. Right. Um, and a newer situation that we're seeing is the energy crisis now is, I don't, I'm sure you guys have right. seen the lights of the Eiffel Tower being shut down. A lot of larger building lights in Europe, especially are being turned off to reduce right. energy. And so I think this is another opportunity right. for us to seize this moment. And people are finally realizing that like all of this unnecessary lighting is a waste of resources. It's harming the environment and it's right. a really simple fix. Right, yeah. Um, another great one here. This is from Isabel here um, from the School of Architecture. We watched City Dark recently in our Love school. Love that movie. Yep. <laughs> and thank you, another Stephen. Thank you. And um, she writes, she learned in the documentary that our inability to see clearly that the stars could inhibit the growth of science. And she's talking about the inability to see asteroids. So she's, on, she's asking, what are your main concerns and how the issue could endanger the future. So I guess this is going on into like the higher levels of light into space. Yeah, so um, I used to work at the Mount Lemmon Sky Center Observatory uh, in Tucson and right next to it is an asteroid hunting observatory. And okay. they need the dark skies in order to actually detect potentially earth impacting asteroids. Sure, and yeah. It's really, really important to have those dark skies because humans are actually way better at detecting differences in like algorithms that are the photos that show potential asteroids than algorithms. Mm -hmm. um, and one of our, our IDA Massachusetts chapter leaders used to work at the White Sands Missile Base as well, which detects asteroids that are about to hit the earth. And so I'm actually going to ask him to put on a lecture about it um, oh, wow. next year at some time, because I think it's a super important issue. And, you know, beyond just detecting potential earth impacting asteroids, we've seen support from military bases because I think in San Antonio, they have a military base where they do night vision goggle training and they're unable to do their military training when there's too much light pollution because their night vision goggles don't work. Um, oh, wow. So there's like a lot of reasons actually to have military and different like army bases on board with this, which is another great potential opportunity to really scale dark sky advocacy work. 
um, excuse me, I have just sniffling this. So I have um, Colin asks, what is your favorite place to be where the night sky is so prominent and so clear? You, um, <laughs> well, my favorite place in the whole world is probably where I grew up in Moab, Utah. The, the uh -huh. skies there just have a special place in my heart. And when you see like the rolling red rock canyons under a setting crescent moon with the <laughs> Milky Way, it's just another <laughs> level of stunning. Uh -huh. Um, and it really transports you and, and gives you that sense of awe. Um, but I would also say, you know, you can get amazing, incredible experiences of the night sky, even if you're in a light polluted area, just awesome. looking at the moon through a telescope can change people's lives. Like it's so awe inspiring. There's, there's a, a video called a new view of the moon, which is, um, a man brings a telescope into times square and shows people the moon right. and seeing people's reactions, um, always makes me tear up, but I would say the best place to go is where you can go, where it's accessible to you. And don't let the fact that you have light pollution stop you from having that relationship with the night sky. Speaking about the night sky. Um, and then what place are you really concerned about? Like what, what, where, where do you see the most light pollution? Is that in the, around the world? Where is it most troublesome? Um, I mean, everywhere. Yeah. I mean, I think like the most troublesome thing to me really is the light justice issue though. And I, what I would like to see in dark sky yeah. advocacy efforts is addressing those inequities in the ordinances and retrofits first. Um, so really taking a good look at the community and where light maybe is being used as a tool of surveillance and control and addressing those issues first before, you know, just making it a little bit darker for people in the richer areas with their big telescopes, like, right, right. um, but another, a really emerging threat is, mm -hmm. uh, ocean light pollution, like squid oh. boats and boats that are like giant fishing boats, oh, especially boy. like off the coast of China, the amount, like there are images that show just the night sky is entirely green from wow. the amount of squid boat lighting. In the oh, oh, wow. That's amazing. And it looks like the Aurora, but it's not. And it's yeah, kind yeah. of apocalyptic. Greenhouses also are some an emerging threat. And you'll see giant pink domes in the sky from huge grow houses that um, you know, it's a really easy fix to just install shades on greenhouses, but it's an added cost and a lot of people aren't doing it. Right, right, right. So we have literally three minutes left. And again, like we, you know, we can talk about this for so long. This has been so fascinating and critical, vital to our education here for our architecture students and our understanding around the world. What what's the first thing we can do? So go to the website. What what can how can we all get involved? Yeah, I mean, please join the Advocate Network. Um, come hang out with us at IDA, a bunch of dark sky nerds, but everyone is so friendly <laughs> and has a lot of great ideas and opportunities to get involved. Uh, the great thing about light pollution efforts is that it's entirely scalable. You can start with your own home. You can work in your city. You can work in your state. You can work on a country level. You can work with mm -hmm. your businesses. You can work in your apartments. You know, um, there are so many ways to get involved, and it's really about assessing your strengths you know, where you feel like you could particularly be the most beneficial and then, and then working there and we can help you identify what those are. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, this is just, I feel like we're just understanding this. So this is so amazing that you brought this to our attention and we're going to follow you and we're going to follow through with this and, and Steven's here and we're going to think about ways to integrate this into the architectural education and, and uh, keep on bringing this to our attention. Betty Maya, thank you so much from all of us here and at the Center for the Living City. We are grateful to you and for everything you do. We've got a whole new fan base following. Oh, you. So <laughs> great. Thank you guys so much. This was such an honor and really cool to come for full circle and talk to Stephen and Chelsea. And I'm incredibly grateful for all of your support. Would not be here without you guys and uh, look forward to continuing the work. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for being here. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. Bye, -bye. <laughs> Bye.